Welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy, and hello, viewers and listeners. And for the first time ever, we get to say hello, audience, for our live taping. Make some noise. Make more noise than that. That's great. Yes, hello. And great. you, too, who don't want to be on camera. <laughs> the thousands of people that you're not seeing here. <laughs> Uh, no, it's really great that you're all here. Uh, we're really excited about doing this. We've been having fun doing this now for uh, a little over a year now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, we were audio for a while, and we've just recently switched to video. And uh, before we get going in our, our topics for today, I uh, just want to put in a plug, first of all, to people seeing this, that you should let people know about our podcast. Uh, do the things that people do to let people know about stuff right. like this. Follow us, subscribe. Yeah, rate us, write reviews, things like that. that and is tell all your friends. And tell your friends. And that's true for all of you here, too. If you would do that, that would be great. And we also want to put in a plug, and although we'll be mentioning the book a few times in the course of this, because part of what we're talking about today is kind of a bit of a retrospective about the podcast, but um, I want to put in a plug for my book, uh, which I should have brought a copy of to hold up, but on the video we'll, we'll, show, the, <laughs> we'll show the cover of the book, uh, Reigniting the Spark. Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Um, that is available anywhere books are sold. And we're selling them today, and you can get an autographed copy. Yes, exactly. So the next time we do a live taping, which will probably be at some point, uh, and probably in some other geographical areas, you can come and also get a copy of the book. So, Judy. Yes. <laughs> We talked about sort of doing kind of a retrospective mm -hmm. uh, of our podcast, and it seems like since this is the first live one we're doing, we might start with a discussion of what the heck the seven words are all about. Does that right. make sense? So sure. why don't you tell folks what the seven words are? Okay, so Bruce's seven word formula is be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Yeah, so I, I always like to give the origin story of the seven words because you know, it's, it's boiling everything down to a very small formula. Uh, this originated um, well over 20 years ago. I've been in private practice now for, what, 26 and a half years, I think. Mm -hmm. So early on, in the first few years, I was in a, a, a consultation group. And on the way out, one of my colleagues said to me, hey, how do you do couples therapy anyway? Realizing it was kind of a, one of those silly questions. And I thought for a moment, I said, well, I suppose if I had to boil it all down, I basically am telling people in one way or another, be kind and don't panic. And then, you know, I, I, I thought, well, that's a nice summary. And I realized after a while, yeah, that doesn't quite cover it. Because the thing is, what do I mean by be kind and don't panic? Be kind means, it sounds like be nice to people. It does mean nice, although being kind in the way I'm talking about it isn't always nice. It means treat people as kin. Mm -hmm. And if, of course, in a couple, treat people as close kin. Sure. But in general, treat people as fellow human beings, even if you're upset or angry or, you know, off. And I realized you can't do that if you're panicking. Mm -hmm. And many of the techniques and theories I was taught in my training, you know, to be a therapist was all about don't panic. Because if you're panicking and, you know, the whole chunks of brain are offline and you really can't be kind very effectively when you're in a panic. It's all about fight or flight or freeze, and so generally that makes it impossible. So there's my formula, be kind and don't panic. But then, of course, people would say, well, that's nice. How do you not panic? Mm -hmm. And so, how do you not panic? How do you not panic? <laughs> Funny you should say. Question. Yeah, the solution there is to have faith. And so now I'm going to put in a shameless plug for the book. Mm -hmm. Because the way I organized the book is in four sections. Be kind is one section, don't panic is another, and have faith. So you've got to get seven words, you have to count and. Six words just doesn't cut it. It's got to be seven, right? And have faith. And then the fourth one is, you remember what it is? Now go and learn. Now go and learn. Yeah, so why don't you tell the story the of... Book. Yeah, you read the book. <laughs> but you want to tell the story where, where that derives from? Okay, sure. Um, so it's, it's a Jewish tale of uh, a... Scoffer, I guess they call him. Some guy shows up at the, there's two famous Hillels. No, two, two famous, famous rabbis. Two right famous now. rabbis, Shammai and Hillel. And they had different schools. 
And Shammai was known kind of like a prickly guy, and Hillel was known as a little bit more nice, let's just say. He was on that be kind list. So the scoffer shows up at Shammai's house, and he says, I want you to teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. And Shammai, I think, like hit him. And yeah, well, he, he, Shammai was a carpenter, and he took his carpenter square and whacked him. Right. And, and he away. said, get out of here. The scoffer comes to Hillel's house. Hillel's in the bathtub, right? Puts on a towel, comes to the door. Guy says, I want you to teach me the whole Torah while I'm standing on one foot. So Hillel thinks for a moment, and he says, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. The rest is commentary. Yeah, that is the whole Torah. That is the whole Torah. Yes. The rest is commentary. Now go and learn. Now go and learn, exactly. So. so, not to be too grandiose, but I just picked up on that with my formula. Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. That's what you need to know about being in a couple. The rest is commentary. Now go and learn. So the fourth section of the book is now go and learn, which is basically applying these ideas to various uh, various examples that come up a lot in my work as a couples therapist. So that's what the seven words are all mm -hmm. about. Right. And that I keep using it, you know, there, I, I say this to couples a lot, you know, when what you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know that one? So I have my favorite formula and I keep thinking, well, but I'll bet this applies. And so I, I tend to apply that formula. I have, I have a, a couple of shticks like that. I've been doing this long enough that it's, a lot of it is a shtick by now, you know. I like, I like a Borscht Belt comic, you know, <laughs> but... <laughs> I, I hope your couples find you amusing. They, I, they seem to, I mean... <laughs> at least they the, keep coming back. They keep coming back. You know, <laughs> leave them wanting more, you know. So, the, I, I do keep applying it. It does seem to be um, helpful to folks. The other thing, before we um, get into some questions that we have from our audience, and thank you to, the, there's two we have already, and perhaps there will be more generated in the course of our conversation. Um, those of you who listen to this podcast, you know, have listened to it way back when, we almost always have a listener question that mm -hmm. we cover. And if we have guests on the show, we ask the guests, you know, we've had really neat guests, actually. We've had a lot of fun guests. We've had a lot of fun guests, and they will give their particular spin on whatever the listener question is. So we have a couple of audience questions today. But before we do that, I just wanted to look back over our, our many different um, episodes we've done. This is episode number 43, I believe. So we've done, you know, 42, 42 before. <laughs> That's this six times seven. I thought this was no, 43. 43. This is, okay. uh, yeah, this is 43. So what it turned out, by far, one of the most popular episodes in terms of downloads totally surprised me. Anybody want to guess, by the way, that some of you I know have heard some of our podcasts. Anybody in here call out if you you can guess what topics would be like super, would tend to be the more popular ones? Money. Yeah, money, although we haven't done one specifically about money, but have done, we've certainly touched on it in, in other contexts. Yeah, any, any other ones you would I imagine? I the one about uh, your birth, the recent one, birth, why, you know, finding your bishop. Ah, that yeah, that's, was popular. That was popular. But not our most. But not, and it's hard to tell yet because that's so recent. That's yeah. true. So it's only, we just did that a week ago or two, two weeks ago, whatever. We just did that recently. But um, no, it's not that one. And we've, we've done several on sex. You'd think sex would be popular. Well, they were pretty popular. You know, there was, those were popular ones. But the most popular one by an enormous percentage, it's probably like 70 or 80% more popular than the average, was one called It's Not About Communication. And I'm trying to figure out what about that makes it so incredibly like, why does everybody want to download this? It may be because it had the word communication in it, mm -hmm. and everybody wants to search for communication. That's why I did a video and then and a chapter in the book, actually, or a section in the book, and also we did this podcast about that topic. It's not about communication. Well, maybe that's intriguing. Or maybe it's because there was an exclamation point in it, and maybe that, you know, maybe that stimulated the search algorithms. I have no idea. But I wanted to talk just briefly about the, that shtick, because it's a useful... I think it's useful, and besides, then we'll say in our blurb about this one that it includes a little thing about it's not about communication, and then more people will download it. Right? <laughs> it was so popular the first time. It was, so let's, <laughs> let's go for it again. But I, I did enjoy that, and now, of course, I mean, maybe you can touch on this, like, why do you suppose, why would I start from the premise of saying it's not about communication? I mean, um, what do you suppose couples are? 
Well, because everybody's always saying, I, I, I can't communicate, I talk and he's not listening or she doesn't hear what I'm saying, mm -hmm. I think we have a problem communicating. Yeah, which is, that is, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's a substantial percentage of people in the first session mm -hmm. are telling me we need to communicate better. Right. And yeah, exactly the, those things. And I realized in doing the work with folks that oddly enough, it seems to me you know, every once in a while I will meet a couple where one or the other is somewhere on the autistic spectrum. There, there are actual communications problems. In other words, somebody, I remember I've some, uh, a um, footnote in my book uh, mentions this. Um, I worked with somebody a while ago who literally did not know if his wife asked him a question to which he did not know the answer, mm -hmm. he would simply not say anything because he thought it'd be disrespectful of her time to say anything if he didn't know the answer to a question. He literally did not know. Yeah, it's right. It, the meta level is something that if you're neurotypical, as opposed to neuroatypical, if you're neurotypical, then you understand that meta level pretty well. It's like if somebody asks you a question for crying out loud, say something, because the, in addition to the content of the question, they're also saying, did you hear me? And do you care enough to answer me? Sure. You know, are you being respectful of me? You know, or, hello, I'm here. Right, acknowledge my presence. Acknowledge my, yes, my presence, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the vast majority of people I work with have no such difficulties. They're not communicating ineffectively at all. The problem is what they're communicating. What they're communicating is often, when, at least when I'm meeting couples in their first sessions, anger, mistrust, um, fear sometimes, uh, a lot of pain. Um, they're often freaking out, which is when you know uh, conversations tend to go off the rails. And but they're very effectively communicating that. So my whole shtick about it, it's not about communication. It's not about what. It's not about one's ability to communicate. Usually, it's about what you're thinking underneath that, or feeling, or what you're what you're communicating. Mm -hmm. And so that message seems to have been a, a popular message. We'll see what happens with this. You know, we'll, we'll put that somehow in the blurb for this, <laughs> for this podcast and take it from there. So on that note, I guess we should uh, invite, we, I know we have two that we know of already, mm -hmm. right? Two mm -hmm. uh, listener or audience questions already. So And, and uh, yeah. I, I didn't say this when people signed in, but we also have paper out by the table, so if you'd rather not say your own question and you'd rather us read it, you can write it down and we'll be happy to read your question too. So with that, um, why don't you, you, you know who the two folks are, why okay. don't you, you know, uh, so, <laughs> figure who ought to go first. <laughs> so Karen, would you like to step up to the mic uh, right by you and uh, ask your question? Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Karen Cody, and my husband Chris is here with me today. And our question is, primarily my question, what happens when the activity that brought a couple together becomes very difficult for one partner to do? Physical activities such as geocaching, hiking, running, boot camp, kayaking, and camping is what attracted us to each other to begin with. We enjoyed these activities together for many years. During COVID, I stopped moving and gained weight. Now my knees and my ankles are in very bad shape and I can only do easy, flat, simple things. My husband hasn't slowed down at all. In fact, he has increased his activity level by exercising with more fit friends. So most weekends, I am sitting home, unable to join him in his fun. I blame myself, I try to lose weight. He hasn't said anything negative to me about this. He, has, he isn't angry with me, but part of me is resentful and I feel left out. I have seen a doctor and now I have two legitimate diagnoses that are affecting my health. But I can't help but feel that I have failed to keep up my end of the marriage. The, ample, the answer seems simple, I must lose weight. But meanwhile, I want to be the person that he fell in love with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you for that right. question. Judy, wanna, why don't you take a crack at that question? <laughs> what are your okay, thoughts? Okay, so this, this is the lay, the lay person's thoughts, and then we'll go to the doctor next, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. 
you know, it, it, it's so hard to say, because first of all, um, I don't know how, you said that Chris is being supportive of you, your husband's being supportive of you, but have you had a conversation with him as to what, how he feels about your not being able to be part of those same activities that you were, because this is, a lot of this is the way you're feeling. And um, to what extent are you able to participate? If you can't participate on that same level that you did before, so for example, if he's going on a hike or a run, is there, could you go on the car ride with him? Uh, could you be there while he's doing that and, and do another activity that meets more with your physical comfort level so that you're still included somewhat in it to the extent that you feel it, that you're able to physically um, without feeling like you're totally shut so that you're not sitting in your house but maybe you're waiting at the finish line for when yeah. he finishes the race you know bring him to the race wait at the finish line have the refreshments you know to until such time that you're able to feel more physically able to participate what can you do that will satisfy yourself to give you an ability to participate somewhat with him well the first question, could, you, could you go to the mic, Karen? Because we oh, just want people uh, on the recording. The first question about um, the first question: Do we talk about it um, every week? Mm -hmm. Because we make our plan for what we're going to do on the weekend, and the plan revolves around basically what is Chris going to do on the weekend, and how am I going to fit into it? And a prime example is yesterday. Chris went to Chester and ran how many miles? Six hours. Six hours. A six hour race. And at first I thought I would go to Chester and hike around some easy hikes while he uh, did the run. And then I found out that he was going to stop and bury or Northfield or something and pick up a friend of ours a man that I know very well and a woman that I've never heard of and they were going to go with him and they were the three of them were going to do it as a team and I really felt like at that point that I would be in the way because they were they were clearly going to be a unit they were going to run this six-hour race together and then when it was over, they were probably going to stop by a brewery and, and all that's okay because that's, that's what we used to do. Um, we like breweries and so that was kind of like our reward for running six hours or ten miles or whatever we would do. And so he left before I woke up and got home around, I don't know, late in the, late in the day. And he had a good time, and I'm glad that he did, and his friends had a good time, and nobody got injured. And so I'm glad that he got to spend his day that way. Um, I wish I could have been a part of it. Mm -hmm. So I want to jump in, if I could, with the, the um, it's so interesting. I, we, we, you had sent your question before, so we had a chance to look at it. And it was interesting because, you know, I, I, Judy and I bounced off each other a little bit. And Judy gave you a utterly practical kind of invitation, which you are then talking about. Do you know what I mean? And I, I'm going to give you what I, I'm thinking of as sort of, this is why therapists are so annoying. I'm going to give you an annoying therapist answer instead of the kind <laughs> of answer that, that an actual practical person Connected that your pal to the, would give you. Yeah, that your pal <laughs> would give you, right? No, because he, what, what I'm hearing in the conversation between the two of you is, of course, quite obviously what it is, which is a conversation between two very intelligent people who are, you know, mulling over a difficult problem. Of course you are. So here's the annoying therapist answer. I'm going to go for, I'm going to question the premise of your original question, which is that that's what attracted you. Because I'll bet there's a lot of things that attracted you besides that. So taking nothing away from your, your mutual angst around the fact that something that was really fun for both of you and it was really a source of connection 
is now much more difficult because the circumstances have changed. I get that. But that's not, you know, just the idea, and I'm, I have the copy of your question in front of me, just, you know, these, the activities you list are what attracted my husband and me to each other. I'm just going to gently suggest that's not all, right? You didn't say it was all, by the way. But I want to emphasize, no, that's not all that attracted the two of you to each other. And the fact that you can deal with a difficulty like you're describing, which is painful, right? I mean, literally and, and you know, physically and emotionally painful. And yet, you are also describing how here's your husband. I, we see you there, Chris. It's like, <laughs> you're actually there. Um, and he's not resentful of it. And, you know, you're having a hard time with it for what well, seems to me like totally understandable reasons that that's not all that attracted you. There's, there's other things. You know, it's sort of putting it in larger terms. What happens over the course of a life and a marriage is inevitably those losses are going to be part of the story. You know, you can't get old without that. Maybe I just turned 70. I wonder, am I, am I mm -hmm. starting to be more conscious of that sort of thing? Perhaps that's another factor in my response. I don't know, Karen, what do you think about it? Yeah, we, um, we love to debate. Um, and religion is one of the things that we love to debate uh -huh. and it doesn't matter how sick or sore or painful I am I can debate mm -hmm. and he came home from work one night it was about three or four weeks ago and we stood in the kitchen having a little glass of wine before dinner and this was like five o'clock and at eleven o'clock we realized we were still in the kitchen drinking wine, debating religion, <laughs> and said, damn, we forgot to eat dinner? Uh -huh. We better go to bed. Yeah, yeah. And so See, this is a couple that, there are things that we can find to do. Oh, yeah. Well, and you already are. You know what I mean? I, I meet lots of couples in the course of my work, and I, I've said this to Judy many times. I have long since given up, way given up, even trying to predict in my own mind, are these people going to be okay or not? Do you know what I mean? Having said that, when I hear stuff like you were just saying, I'm thinking, oh, you're, you're going to be fine. I'm not saying you will be free of pain and difficulty. I'm just saying you're going to be fine. Yeah. Precisely because of that. But it's like, no, you're, you know, yeah, stuff but happens. But there's the loss of oh, the yeah, loss the is physical activities. Well, and activities. this yeah. week, um, I don't remember what day it was, but w this week we went to New Hampshire to go hiking. And the plan was to go a certain distance. And I got to seven miles, and my body just stopped. And I, we had another friend with us, and I said to them, I, I can't go another step. Um, I really, I can't move. I have to stop right here. Mm -hmm. And I stopped under a tree. And they, they, they finished. We were only a quarter of a mile from the car, mm. but they were able to go and get the car and come back and get me. So I'm still trying, um, but, you know, it's just, it's not like it was, and I feel, I feel guilty. Mm. And, um, and, I, and I feel guilty because... It's, it's me, it's me, you know, yeah. doing it. I, I, I very often tell people, please save guilt for when you've done something wrong. Uh, but that's, you know, that's an easy thing to say. But, and Elaine, I see, uh, I see you want to, you, you want to say something. Hang, hang on just one second and we'll, we'll invite that. I do, what I want to do before we in, ask her any other comments, because we do have another question. And I also, I do feel like I just want to offer Chris an opportunity to say hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Chris. <laughs> if you would like to, do you want? Is there stuff? If you'd like to say something, please say it in the mic so that folks on the recording can hear. Yes, I, I agree with you that definitely there was more, and sometimes <clears throat> I'm maybe a little too analytical because I like the annoying <laughs> uh, <laughs> therapist answer. Is there a gendered I, piece to this? Also, <laughs> I don't know. There, there may be. There may be. I don't know. Um, and two men I, being the annoying people, is, that, is, that, is there a trend there? I don't know. And I don't have a problem with like not making it whatever you want to call it. I actually, <laughs> she kept trying and I said, sit down, stay there in the shade and wait. We will be back in a very short time. Mm -hmm. It's not a problem. And what would you tell me if I was racing and suddenly I was 
can you go any further? Sit down, wait. It's fine. I don't find it a big problem myself. The, the, yes, the debates, the intellectual is very good too. There's a lot of other things I agree, but I don't, Thank you. I don't see a need to feel guilt, really. But yeah. I'm with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank no you for, for the question, Karen, and thank you for both. And yeah, uh, Elaine, did you want to, is sort of on, on the same topic before we go to another, yeah. Okay. I, just an observation. In the question, it said that things had turned to basically, they're planning to do stuff together to planning around what Chris is doing. Is there an opportunity to have some of those weekends be planned around what Karen would like to do and and still have them do things together because I think that's very one-sided. It gets to be, oh, what are you doing for this weekend and not every once in a while it should be, well, what does Karen want to do this weekend so that they can have a little bit more cohesion? Sure. Yeah, and that's the kind of thing, I, again, I would, I would speculate that's, that's what I'll, I'll bet they're figuring that out, but I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to turn it into a therapy session, but no. yes. <laughs> thank you for the observation, yeah. Yeah, and you know, that might be something, Karen, that you want to think about, that if you do want to be part of that weekend, if he's going on a six-mile run, that you know you can't do it, but you know, Chester's a fun town, you might want to bring a friend along and you know, do your own thing while you're down there, and you know, go to the Vermont Country Store in Weston, or you know, go. Well, you know about Chester. Right? Well, I used to live in Weston, and I. This message I, I has been taught, brought to you by the I Chester. 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 Chester's in, <laughs> yes, Chester's a neat little town. Okay, we can check those, that off on our list now. That yes, you that can. We, we those paid, this beautiful they paid Victorian that, houses in the town. You know, it's a nice place yeah. to walk around. There are, like you said, nice hikes in the air. So maybe you could bring a friend along. And then, you know, afterwards, you can all meet at your brew pub, and, and that way you're not feeling left out like you're sitting at home. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I think Elaine also brings up a good point. But if that was so much a part of your life, like weekends were going on a physical activity, as I said earlier, maybe there's something you could do in a li more limited way. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. You're welcome. So we have another question. Uh, Erica, I invite would Erica? You like to? Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. This is great. I'm glad I made the last minute decision today. I'm glad um, you came we're glad to, to. to come. So this question is based out of a more orthodox Jewish practice mm -hmm. um, around separation between couples for a period of time um, during like a physical separation during each month. And so I'm wondering about how you've seen people successfully uh, cultivate intimacy that doesn't involve necessarily the physicality um, because I know that they're there and we're learning them um, but I'm curious to hear what you've seen before mm -hmm. thank you well I can't say what I've seen before um, from a therapist standpoint but uh, you know I I was brought up not Orthodox but I went to an Orthodox yeshiva so, uh, which is a school for Orthodox people. And um, so I'm familiar with that there's the Tarat Mishpacha, tarat mishpacha yeah. Shomrei Nagia of a part of the month you're talking about when a woman has her period and men and women are not allowed to touch. I mean, even, even touch the same plate type of thing. Like you can't hand your partner, in this case would be a husband, you can't hand your your partner a plate, uh, you could, you'd have to put it down on the table and then he would have to pick it up separately. So there are some very specific practices around that, but it's also a great opportunity. You're talking about how to have intimacy. That is a great, 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 great time to find a very intimate way of communicating with each other and talking about things that, you know, and then it could almost heighten when you do get the part where you are physical and you know that's why you see a lot of orthodox families with a lot of children because you know you have that two week period where you're not touching but you're building up an intimacy through conversation through getting to know each other on a very deep um, intellectual level where it's not involving physicality you know too often um, couples get together and the first thing they do is have sex before they even know the other person's name. And then you wake up in the morning and you say, like, oh, 
who, who, who did I just have sex with? And it, it's that type of thing. So you're getting to know each other physically before you even know each other um, on a real deep spiritual level. So how do you build a relationship from that? And then they go, well, you know, then you have all kinds of problems. This is like the opposite. You have that opportunity to get to know each other and really focus on your needs and wants so that when you are able to come together, it's that much deeper. Yeah, and if, if I could uh, add, add some to that. Yeah, so, yeah, and that, and Eric, I imagine just from your question, you're very familiar with the stuff we're talking about. We're doing a lot of explaining for the benefit of people who don't know about that. Um, and certainly, it is fascinating that when I've talked with people involved in that, or in parts of my past life had some experience of it as well, it's a really interesting phenomenon that not only, everything you're saying of course makes sense, not only are, does it give an opportunity for intellectual, spiritual kind of conversation, it also can be profoundly sexual even though you're not actually touching. Even though you're not actually doing anything that people would say is having sex. It can be tremendously erotic as well as all of the other things, and those they're all mushed in together anyway, those, mm -hmm. th those kinds of connections. And that's one of the things that I think people who adopt those practices, you know, in the, the entire Orthodox world pretty much, it's a very widely practiced. It, 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 by the way, folks, we're, we're here in a Reformed temple, for those of you who don't know, we're here at Temple Sinai in uh, South Burlington, Vermont. And uh, the reform, folks who grew up in the Reform or even conservative movements, I didn't learn anything about Ta Mishpacha in my conservative upbringing. Nothing. Which means family purity, by the way. Oh, family, yes, so family purity. But the, the, the laws of family purity, which is a euphemism for basically the laws of when you're allowed to have sex or not. And I learned nothing about that as a kid. I only learned it as an adult as I got more deeply involved in Jewish practice. And it's an interesting phenomenon for people who practice it that it is those, those two weeks of non-touching are, I think many people would say, are not at all asexual. They're just not touching. And it does indeed, you know, and of course if you do the math on that, you talk about how Orthodox families have a lot of kids. Guess when you go to the mikvah, again I know you know this, but you know, for those who don't, at the end of that two week period, that's when the woman goes to the mikvah, uh, the, uh, which is a ritual, ritual bath, ritual bath immerses herself in a, spiritually in a ritual bath. Uh, and then is available, she and her husband are available to have sex with each other. And guess when that is in the month? Peak fertility, you know. So it, it seems to work out pretty well in terms of propagating lots of uh, Orthodox Jewish people. So anyway, my, my point being that it's, that the, the ways you can have of connecting during that time can be profoundly erotic. They don't have to be you know, non-erotic. And I want to make that a broader statement because I think that is true for folks who don't happen to be following that particular, those particular practices also. That when couples have a, a lively erotic life, and that's independent of, again, whatever you think having sex is or not. Because there are plenty of couples that for whatever reason don't do things that would be called having sex but nevertheless are erotically connected. Um, that that's just another example of that. So to be open to those possibilities, to be recognizing, you know, the, the joke people will say, it's, it's only partly a joke, the, the, the thing that men need to learn is that, you know, sometimes doing the dishes is foreplay, you know? <laughs> that the idea that sometimes doing things that just, and it's usually gendered in this direction when people talk about this particular thing, doing things that take a load off, you know, in a heterosexual marriage, and take a load off the woman is, she's much more apt to then be open to more possibilities than if she's constantly burdened and looking at the guy and thinking, what good are you? And that, that it does tend to be gendered in a particular direction, largely because, you know, in evolutionary terms, what women as a group speak, I realize I'm speaking very broadly here. I'm not about to tell all the women in the room what women know. I've, heard, I've learned this from women, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but you know, at the risk of mansplaining, what I hear from women, you know, the act of being sexual with a man, <laughs> saying the obvious, opens up the possibility of pregnancy. It doesn't do that for men, it does it for women. And so women have evolved in such a way that you're going to be looking to see, is this a guy I can trust to be the father of my kid? Right. 
Whereas for men, it's just about admission. Mm -hmm. Say, well, will she let me in so I can propagate my genes? It's, it's, it ends up being a very different evolutionary imperative. So for all of those reasons, if a couple can develop the ability to have an erotic connection that isn't just about touching, that's all to the good. And you know that the orthodox practices really codify that. You know, they, they're real specific guidelines that I, I, I don't know of other uh, practices that are similar to that, maybe just because I don't know. Does that, uh, does that touch yeah. on what you're asking about? Thank you. Yeah, Sebastian. I'm, I'm just curious. Could, so you, could you go on the mic? Sorry yeah, to be yeah. annoying about that, but then people will be able to hear you. Sure. So for those two weeks, this is, an, I guess, an orth question about orthodoxy. So for those two weeks that you're not allowed to be physically intimate, like phone sex? Interesting, Can you have fun sex? Masturbation would generally be off the table. Uh, in those cases, at least for men, I don't know if it would be for women. Do you know? Uh, you know, there are no specific prohibitions for women. For women, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the rabbis just didn't think women did those things. So go ahead, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> no, great question. I, I, uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not versed in, in the rabbinics of that. But yeah, I really don't think there are specific prohibitions against women. But there um, are for men. But there and are for men. So, and the, and I, I can say, I think pretty confidently, it would be considered not in the spirit of the thing to do phone sex. But picking up on what I said earlier, what do you call phone sex? You know, you can have very erotically charged conversations that maybe aren't explicitly sexual. Or you could even have yeah. them that are sexual. Or I mean, in, in, yeah. Those, yeah. in that time, I mean, you could sit and tell your partner your fantasies, for example, yeah. or, you know, do all kinds of fun I'm, stuff. I'm imagining the, you know, the guy saying to his wife, wait until mikvah night, or the wife saying to the guy, hey, wait until mikvah night. You know, that's, that's when they can have sex again. So they, yeah, they could be referring to their sexual connection in a way that just, you know, ups the electric charge. Uh, but it's a great question, Sebastian. It never, never occurred to me, is that, <laughs> is that kosher or not? I don't know. You know who would know? Shmuley Botea. with kosher sex? <laughs> yeah, if you, if you reach Shmuley Botea, kosher sex. Part of which, by the way, I, how can I say this? In a, in a, in a public, um, I have to be careful because, you know, this is a, a public recording. I don't want to say anything bad about Shmuley because I, a lot of what he writes is wonderful. Uh, some of what he writes, some people have said, especially women, is perfectly awful <laughs> from there, uh, and I'm not taking sides on that, but just, you know, interesting question. He would know, though. He's an Orthodox rabbi. He would know that. Yeah, other uh, questions at this moment? Yes, Elaine. Step to the mic, please. Step to the mic. Oh, for somebody who didn't think they were going to have questions, this is good. Okay, so you mentioned communication. Probably I should go back and listen to the podcast. Um, but That's a hint, I have, by the way, folks. <laughs> there you go. Um, you can buy the book, too, by the way. Folks. I can't take credit for it, but I have a saying. Words are like bullets. You cannot take them back. Mm. You can say you're sorry, and, but once they're out, they're out. And when I am dreadfully upset, I can't communicate why I am upset. And my question is twofold. I, you know... I find that I need to calm down and kind of think about the situation before I can speak. But on the other hand, then David, who's in the audience, is left with, well, what's wrong? And I'm like, I can't talk right now. And, and so how, when one partner is upset, and I also find that the thing that you're upset about or the thing that someone else is upset about is usually not what's making them upset. It's a result of that frustration. Mm -hmm. So the twofold question is, one, how does the person who doesn't realize what's going on help the person through that? And how does the person who's just really madder than a March hare, I don't know why March hares are mad, get to that it's level the Mercury, where... By the way. It's, it's what? The, it's Mad Hatter. It's the Mad, the mad Hatter. Hatters that are, yeah, I can't, oh. here's a pedantic point for you. Oh, okay. Because Hatters used to use mercury, and so they would go crazy. Oh, that makes That's sense. That's where Mad Hatter comes that from. That makes sense. So, but how does the person who's just definitely upset and kind of knows what's going on get, to get themselves deflated mm -hmm. to the point where they can actually express what's 
really going on? Yeah, great question. Those and that's, great, yes. that, that's in the second part of the formula, the, the <laughs> don't panic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, so that comes to, yes. I, I know a good book that addresses this, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, because no, that's a great that's a great point. That is precisely that, as you probably realize in asking the question, that is a classic problem. Uh, it's one of those things. It's so common that you know, if it didn't exist, somebody would have to invent it. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's because what happens is, indeed, it's exactly what you said. Obviously, Elaine is exactly what you said. That you get upset, and then the part of your brain that could explain to the other person, or even connect to the other person, to say this is what's upsetting me, hang on, I'll be all right in 30 seconds, just hang in there. That part is not available. It's just not there, it's offline. They show this with functional MRI scanners. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you read about that or seen those? You know, the functional MRI, it's, you, know, you probably all know what an MRI is, is you know, scanning equipment. It shows where the blood is going in the brain, which is to, it's kind of a, a proxy for where's the action in the brain. Well, there are volunteers who will go on in these things and let themselves be panicked. I can't imagine doing that, but thank you to those brave people, or crazy people or something, some combination, who will let themselves do that. It's really, I, I, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, trivialize that. That's really important research. And what it shows is, when you get a, to a certain level of upset, whole chunks of neocortex are offline, like the parts that can talk, you know, with some degree of rationality. They're gone. They're just not available until you calm down. So that phenomenon, of course, the, the real kicker in a, in a couple, and this is, again, wonderfully, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It, had this been invented by a person, it would have been an evil genius. You know? <laughs> the, the, what happens in a couple is that that particular response of going offline panics the other one. Mm -hmm. That's the brilliant, yes, isn't that brilliant? Yeah, and that's so common that one person in a couple is going to be the one who's saying, no, no, we can't stop now, we have to resolve this or I'm going to panic. And the other person is saying, we can't resolve this right now because I'm already in a panic and I can't talk to you. So what the heck do you do about that? I don't know, Judy, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Beats the heck out of me. Serenity <laughs> now! <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. No, I will. It's funny. I, I'm being rather flippant here, but I do have an answer to it, but the answer is really just a phrase that describes, you know, somehow get out of this, you know? It's get hold of yourself. So if you have enough of your neocortex available to remember to say something like, hang on a second, I just need to get a hold of myself and then maybe I can talk, that may be enough reassurance to the person who's freaking out at the fact that their spouse seems to be suddenly disappearing, which is like, it feels like abandonment. And, and you do realize in these moments of high you know, high anxiety, the problem is that we have no sense of time. So the, the, the thoughts that in a calm moment you can say, I'll be okay for the next five minutes here while we sort this out, or the last 17 times we had something like this, it was fine 10 minutes later, you know? Those thoughts are simply not available. It is timeless. You're losing each other and it's, you know, it's a complete disaster and you have to panic about it, you know? So you have to do something to get hold of yourself and that, you know, so what the heck good does that do, you know? And what would you say about that? Well, I would say, were I in that position, I would say to you, give me some time. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to you when I'm able to. But that's presuming you have the presence of mind to be able to think that and say it. Well, that's true. And you're a pretty calm person in that way. I am a pretty yeah, calm which person. Yeah, <laughs> which helps. Yeah, that's the other thing, you know. Everybody be like her, you know. <laughs> The trouble is most of us aren't. <laughs> Although, you know, I, I think that you probably know each other well enough by now that if you were to say to David, give me five, that maybe that could become your safe word, um, that type of thing. Maybe mm -hmm. you can come up with something between you that when you see Elaine having a meltdown, is like this is the time I better step back yeah. and let her collect herself and uh, I'm going to sit there, and when she's ready, she will seek me out. Well, and if, again, if you can pull that off. If but, you can pull But you said off. something I think is really particularly helpful, the whole safe word idea. Because, again, it's not so much what the safe word is or even remembering to use it. It's the, you know, people who are into, like, kinky sex stuff, they have a safe word, right? You know, it's like, yeah, you can tie me up, but I get a, you know, but if I say this word, I really mean untie me. Whereas if I just say untie me, untie me, I just, it may be part of the game, you know? 
this, and I'm, that's, that illusion really makes sense, that, that allusion really makes sense. The whole safe word thing, whether or not you can think about it, if you've talked about it in advance, it can plant in your unconscious just enough so you'll be able to pull it off. And I like to use a, uh, for, for um, this kind of purpose, I'm not talking about kinky sex purposes, I like to use, I've, uh, couples have, have talked about this with me and we've come up sometimes with ideas around this, and I like to use a word that's vaguely ridiculous. It works better if it's vaguely ridiculous. Uh, we, have, we have a friend, I'm thinking of Gary, hi Gary, um, who used the word kumquat for all purposes like that, you know, because kumquat is a funny word. It's just a funny word, kumquat. It's got two K sounds in it, a right. K and a Q. Right. And, and what, what is it, Neil, uh, Neil Simon was the one who in his K place, words are funny. K words are funny, yes. So uh, kumquat is good, or whatever your favorite word is, you know, something, but something vaguely ridiculous, that's a thought. Anyway, yes, Elaine, you want to yeah. follow up? Follow up. I just, just wanted to say that it, the, the whole panic thing, when you're very close to someone and they're hurting uh, and you're trying so hard to help them and you can't help them at the minute, that's, that's, I think that's where that panic comes in. And yeah. so I'm just kind of reaffirming what you said. It's like when this one's panicking and they can't help, they're stuck and they're, you're, both, you're both stuck. Yeah. So. And isn't that ironic that, you know, it's just amazingly ironic that the reason you're panicking is not because you don't care, it's because you do Absolutely. so much. It's because you're Absolutely. so important. Which will lead me, and I think then we can kind of start to start to wrap, <laughs> start to start wrapping up. Um, so thank you, Elaine, for that. Um, that I want to lead around to another one of my major, major themes in the book, mm -hmm. uh, by way of putting in another shameless plug for the book, um, which is uh, the whole concept of stability and intimacy. Because if I were going to say, gee, what, what are the central ideas that are in my book? The, the seven word formula, of course, it's organized around that. Be kind, don't panic, and have faith. But then there's, I, I think I talk about this right in the be kind section. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, or maybe it's in the don't panic. I, I don't remember which one. It could fit either in either one. It's needs that we all have. It's a way of understanding the whole project of being in a couple. And really, it's a way of understanding the whole project of being a human being in some ways. You know, there are lots of people who have done things like Maslow's needs hierarchy and things like that, for those of you familiar with that. You know, there's lots of ways of understanding our needs. And I'm using the word needs advisedly because I don't mean desires, I mean needs. You know, I might desire something, but I can do fine without it. A need is something that if it's not sufficiently fulfilled, something is sick, something is not functioning well. And I'm claiming we have these two sets of needs. And the reason I bother dividing all these needs into two categories is we need them both, but the skills you need for one are very different from the skills you need for the other. And the two are stability and intimacy. And basically, if I boil it all down, you can check out the chapter in the book on this. Stability is all about reducing or avoiding anxiety. And so the skills that we have in terms of being able to, you know, essentially navigate your way through the world and be okay or as okay as you can be under the circumstances with knowing how to, you know, make enough money or find enough money so you can eat and be housed and stuff like that, that really basic stuff, those are stability skills. You have to be both skilled and lucky, right, for those things to be okay. Um, the skill in a relationship of more or less knowing each other well enough to know sort of what your buttons are and you try and avoid them mostly if you can, those are stability skills. You know, couples that are together for a long time have generally developed pretty good stability skills. Well, you get together with somebody and you fall in love and you form a life together and maybe have kids or do things like that or get a house, you know, you up the ante. And what happens is, <laughs> of course, the person becomes more and more important to you. And the problem you run into then is that people are start being afraid to risk stability. Now, why would you need to risk stability? Let's talk about intimacy. Because intimacy by, and I don't mean just sex, I mean sex is often a part of a couple's intimacy repertoire, but that's not the whole thing at all. Intimacy is when you are being present, physically, spiritually, emotionally, with yourself and each other. Honest with yourself, and they're thereby honest with each other. That is not at all about avoiding or reducing anxiety. That is about tolerating anxiety. Because that is it about often creates anxiety. Precisely, right? precisely. It creates anxiety. That is about risking anxiety. Mm -hmm. 
And you know, if you if you know if you have to tell me something that you're displeased with, you can bet I'm not going to be delighted to hear it. But I better be able to hear it and not freak out, or it isn't going to work very well. And what what's interesting is that if you avoid that, because look, you probably do because you're a nice person. You, you probably do avoid that if you can get away with it. You know, because I know there's some things you told me about like years later that you wish I'd been doing differently for the last ten years. <laughs> So evidently, you sat on it for 10 years and you finally decided it was okay to say it. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so, but, because I know that's happened. You've never done anything to bother me, but I know I've done things go. to bother you. So, no, I mean, what I'm saying is that if there's something, and I don't, I don't mean to trivialize it, if there, again, you know, if there's something that is really uh, bothersome, it is risking the stability of the relationship to bring that up. And so what couples, as things get very, very important, what they tend to do is avoid that. That's the subtitle of the book, you know, how stable couples lose intimacy and how to get it back. Well, how to get it back is about learning how to tolerate that anxiety so that you can then risk intimacy. Because intimacy, look, when it feels good, it's wonderful. But when it's something like we were just talking about, it's, yeah. it feels very risky. Right. And so that is one of the chief skills of intimacy is the willingness to displease your partner or at least risk raising your partner's anxiety and your own mm -hmm. as you do so. You know, one of the things, uh, another thing I like to point out is those moments when somebody is saying something to their partner that they're pretty sure their partner won't like, and the quintessential one about this one is in the area of sex. Somebody wants to have sex and the other person doesn't, you know, in that moment. Somebody is saying, hey, can, can we get it on? And the other person is saying, no, nope, not in the mood. How a couple handles that bit of anxiety is both an indicator of how they're doing in general and also a causal factor in how they're going to do. Because if a couple handles that inevitable moment well, and I say it's inevitable, you know, a couple's together long enough, they're, they're not going to be perfectly synchronized for when they want to have sex. It's just not going to happen. So it happens sometimes, but not all the time. So how they handle that moment, when I hear about this from couples, you know, if they say, oh, no problem, and they're relaxed about it, then what are they coming to see me for? You know? <laughs> they're, they're, they have a problem, but they're going to be fine. Now, again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying. But often what I'll hear is not that at all. Often I'll hear is whoever got turned down, which incidentally, by the way, I see probably as much the genders on that in a heterosexual couple, you never know which way that's going to go. I see that both directions. If you have a stereotype in mind that it's like always women turning men down, mm -hmm. not at all. I see everybody as much the other way around. So in any case, how they handle that, if the person being disappointed is gracious and the person doing the disappointing is willing to be honest but also is gracious, they're going to be fine. If the person who's being disappointed is a jerk about it and punishes the other person one way or another, or the person doing the, doing the disappointing is a jerk about it and, you know, doesn't, doesn't allow for the possibility that they are disappointing the other person, then they're in trouble. Well, then that's why they risk, uh, you know, that intimacy. Yeah, well, that's what, yeah. it tends to shut down intimacy right. if they can't. Exactly. Yeah, that, that's what they learn from that is, oh, we can't be honest with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's a problem, uh, typically, in a relationship. But not to end on a problematic note. <laughs> Um, let's, first of all, I want to thank, again, thank you all for the <coughs> question, your questions you're having. Uh, if you have additional questions, this is true, of course, for the folks that are here. This is true for all you folks out there in podcast land. Uh, any questions that you have, please drop us a line. Right. You can email us at bruce at brucechalmer.com or visit brucechalmer.com and you can find ways to... Uh, write in your questions. You can suggest podcast guests. You can even suggest yourself to be a podcast guest. There's I, a little yep. place to fill that out on our form. There is. In fact, there's the, the way to do that, there's, there actually is a tie-in to my schedule, mm -hmm. so there are our, our schedule in terms of podcasting, right. so that you can suggest a time to where we would interview you, and in the course of that, we'll ask you what would you like to be interviewed about, and we'll find out if we think you're a good fit for the show. And uh, that's, we've had people contacting us to be on the show uh, for the last several months right. that's, that's been happening. We've gotten that's, some of our latest guests. We've got some of our really fun guests, so we, we invite you all to do that. Uh, and 
when you go to the uh, podcast tab on brucechalmer.com, that's my website, you'll have access to all of our previous podcasts. And I just want to repeat what I said earlier about please go and do the things that let people know about the podcast. Of course, just tell your friends, email folks and tell them the link. You can get there via brucechalmer.com. You can search for couples therapy in seven words on any place that, that distributes podcasts these days, Apple, iTunes, Spotify, whatever your favorite place is. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, we would like you to get hold of my book. Uh, and so again, when we uh, edit this, you'll see up on the screen, it'll be quite remarkable how the people in, in here, I'm just telling this to the folks in podcast, they're seeing this amazingly suspended cover of the book <laughs> appearing before their eyes. And they're all, you can just see by looking at them, they're all in awe of, how are you making that happen? How are you making brucechalmer.com show up at the bottom of the, of the, right under us right now? It's magic, you know, it's magic how we do these things. So. So we want to thank Temple Sinai for letting us use their facilities, and we want to thank David Punya for being our tech guy today. Our tech guy extraordinaire, and uh, this is, uh, for those who may not have picked this up on other podcasts when we've mentioned it in passing, Temple Sinai is our home synagogue. Uh, this is where we're members here, and we're delighted that they let us use this space. And so, until next time. Remember, be kind. Don't panic. And have faith. Mm -hmm.